Uh, good afternoon, colleagues, classmates, and guests. Um, AIM welcomes you to a Development at Work series, and for this session, we have a special guest. But before that, let me uh, explain a bit about our topic. It's about big data. Um, the, um, our special guest is co-founder of the Flowminder.org, a nonprofit applied research organization that seeks to develop and scale new analytical methods to solve critical gaps in global public health and uh, also pioneers the use of anonymous uh, mobile operator data for modeling of infectious diseases and uh, assessment of population displacement, especially in humanitarian crisis. Um, our guest speaker is Assistant Professor of Stockholm School of Economics in Sweden and currently a visiting professor at the Science of um, Paris. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you our guest speaker, Dr. Eric Petter. Thank you very much. It's always nice to get applause before I say something. Uh, because you never know if you're going to get it after. Uh, good. And I can see it's late in the day since everybody's sitting way back instead of in the front. So I just I'm going to speak a bit louder. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think it's scheduled until 5.30, I won't talk for all that time, but the things that I wanted to cover, first, uh, a bit more detailed presentation of uh, what Flowminder is, uh, some mobile and specific, yeah, big data applications, but specifically mobile data applications, so some of our previous projects, as illustrations of uh, how, how these data sources can be used. Uh, but then maybe more importantly, also talk a little bit about the limitations and the difficulties of using these data sources. Uh, and then, depending on how much time that uh, takes, I'm also going to mention at the end WorldPop, which is another data set, an open data set that we're working on that uh, deals with uh, population densities and that practice. Uh, does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good for you because that's the presentation. So that's the presentation you're going to get. Uh, so, Flowmind is a non-profit organization which you can see at the website because it's not very professional or updated. Uh, we don't have that much money. Uh, but more importantly, the team behind Flowminder. So there is a core team, uh, which are the people here, but then we have a wide network of people all over the world that we work with. And the main point is that everybody that's a member is an academic at some academic institution. So people are professors or assistant professors anywhere. Uh, everybody is a quantitative scientist, so everybody deals with uh, big data set statistics. But most importantly, we have no computer scientists, and I'll, I'll get back to that at the end. Because normally when people talk about big data, it's always the focus on the hardware, the software, the supercomputers. But uh, everybody here is, uh, Shin, for instance, is a quantitative sociologist, network researcher. Linus is a medical doctor and a public health researcher. Caroline, she's an epidemiologist, she works with uh, disease. Uh, Andy is a geographer, uh, he also works with disease, but his focus is mapping. I'm an economist, and then uh, same with the rest of the people. So everybody is uh, an academic in some topic area, but not specifically uh, computer science. Uh, but so Flowminder is actually a pretty new entity. So we founded it, registered it in 2012, but the team has been working in the area for a long time. So uh, as a team, or some of the people in the team, were the first people to use anonymized mobile network data to model the spread of malaria. So this was in Africa in 2009, and they've also done a lot of different projects, uh, mostly in African countries, uh, using these types of uh, data to see how malaria spread, and specifically how to plan if you want to eliminate malaria. Uh, and this data, these studies have also been used quite extensively by the National Malaria Control Program, so the governments in these countries. Uh, also as a team, and these are the, actually, so the Swedish, there is a British team and a and a Swedish team. So the Brits, uh, they pioneered the disease stuff, and the Swedes, uh, we uh, were the first to use this data in disaster response. So uh, it's right after the earthquake in 18, 2010, uh, and I'm going to go into this case in detail. And then also they had a big cholera outbreak after the earthquake in October. Uh, and then currently we have what's the first project then on using this data to look at climate impacts. So we're doing a project in Bangladesh, it's a bit uh, washed out. But then this is a consortium where we're collaborating with the United Nations, specifically United Nations University, 
uh, a Bangladeshi climate research institute, and then Grameen Phone, which is the biggest operator in Bangladesh, and that's owned by Telenor Group, which is a global operator. Uh, quite, it's a Norwegian company, but they're quite big throughout, uh, throughout Asia. So they had a cyclone in May, uh, so we're looking a little bit on how to see what we can use that data for and see how that compares with, with the earthquake. So as a team, uh, we have uh, several years of experience to use these types of data sources in different types of settings for different types of events. So uh, first of all, just to give you some background, so when people talk about displacement or population movement or migration, people tend to think it's one or two, maybe three big events per year. You see it in the news, right? a big typhoon, a big earthquake, a lot of people need to move. But actually, it's, uh, it's very common. So if you look at the statistics, so this is UN statistics, uh, in 2008 to 2010, on average, every other week, you had at least 100,000 people being displaced by floods or landslides or some type of storm. Uh, in the same period, you had 18 mega disasters, which the definition is that you have more than a million people that are displaced. So Yolanda, for instance, where three and a half million people that's five on mega, mega event. Uh, and this is only, these numbers are only for natural disasters, so it excludes droughts, conflicts, and disease outbreaks. So if you add that, then you have a couple of hundred, hundred million people every year that are also affected, and that will be forced to move due to these other events. So having a lot of people move is actually a really big policy problem, both for governments and for aid agencies. So to go into a case then in more detail, so in Haiti, in 2010, in January, you had a big earthquake, 7.0 on the Richter scale, and it hit very close to the capital of Port-au-Prince, which of course is very densely populated. So as an effect of this, you had large population flows. So in the days, weeks following the earthquake, a lot of people left to different places. And of course, uh, yeah, for the aid agencies, this is of course a big problem, because the first issue that you see is uh, getting food to medicine into place. This is usually what you see on the news. So you have a big disaster, you have aid agencies, they say we need money, we need food, we need medicine, we need to get into the affected area. But usually that's over in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's usually difficult in the first few days, but after a few weeks they have everything in place. So then the biggest uh, question becomes, okay, so where are now, where are all the people? So what should we do with all the foods, the medicines, the tents? Where should we send it? Because usually it's very chaotic and you don't really know where, where people are. Houses are destroyed, people are left. Uh, they are all over the place. So Haiti was an interesting case because they actually uh, tested a lot of new technologies, you could say. So one uh, technology that was used in Haiti was satellite imagery. And this is just to show how that can be used. So this is a sports field outside of Port-au-Prince. And this is uh, half a year before the earthquake. So you can see it's a normal sports field. But this is actually from Google Maps, so it's commercially available. Then you can see this is the day after the earthquake, same field, and now you can see actually a few tents or shelters have come out. So some people have taken their stuff, moved there, and put up shelters. And then, uh, since this is commercially available data, it's usually open, and there is actually now, and this is quite recently was introduced, a, a satellite charter, meaning that most of the commercial satellite companies open up their imagery for disaster response purposes. So in the event of a big disaster, for free NGOs can access this type of imagery, which is quite useful because then if we snap forward a few days, you can see that more people are arriving. The day after, you can see even more people are arriving. So if you have this type of imagery and you can track it over time, you can then see how this turns into a camp. And then if we fast forward even a bit further, you can see here in February, something has happened. So this is end of January. And then a week later, or actually a month, oh, sorry, a month later, you can see that now you have this area has been cleared and you have lots of more tents and shelters. And you can specifically see the blue and white ones, and these are usually the UN ones that are distributed. So now this has been designated as an official UN refugee camp. So uh, then you can also see how the UN agencies put up, or the relief agencies put up their tents nearby, and you can then see the inflow of even more people. So throughout the course of this year, this grew from an empty sports field into a full-blown city with streets. So you can then see here streets, 
headquarters, logs, and uh, <coughs> a lot of input. So obviously, and this is really this is readily available. It's obviously quite good if you have no other information. This is of course a good tool for doing some estimations. And now there are also methods for estimating how many people are in each tent, and you can also track over time if you then have some models for this. So that's actually quite good, but this method also has a few uh, drawbacks or issues, and this is very similar to another the trendy thing now is UAVs, or using drones. I think this was actually tried here in, in the Philippines, using these radio drones to take photographs like this. So this is really good, but there are some problems. One problem is you don't see the people, you only see the tents or the shelters. So you make an estimate, you're saying each tent is five people, but you don't know, it could be ten, it could be one. Uh, also the fact was, what was noticed here, and this is also true for other camps, is that a lot of people, since if you register in a camp, then you get food. So actually a lot of people tend to register in more camps in order to get more food, right? or if you have tents and things like that. So there are some ways to mess with the statistics. But the most important problem or drawback with this is uh, you also only measure the people that are actually receiving, the people that are already in the camp. But then the problem is that most people in a disaster, the displaced people don't go to the camps. So, for instance, the latest statistics I read from the Philippines in the aftermath of Yolanda is that the UN estimates uh, were 3.5 million people displaced. Out of those, 350,000 are in the camps, or where they know where they are, they're registered. So 10% are the people that have actually gone to sites like this or gone and registered. 90% have then gone to friends, family, gone to Manila or somewhere else. So there is an estimate on how many people are displaced, but uh, they actually they have no clue where, as to where they are and where they're moving. Uh, Method-wise, this is also measuring the stocks, not the flows. So again, this is an image of New York, for instance. Uh, Manhattan in New York. And just to show another method problem. So the population of Manhattan, if you ask how many people live in New York, most people say about 8 million. And that's probably true uh, at noon on a Wednesday. But if you go to the midnight the same day, most people have gone to their homes, which are in New Jersey or uptown or somewhere else. So what you have when you look at statistics is, of course, only a snapshot of the stock, but you don't know the flows. And for all of you that commute in Manila, you know that the flows is a big issue, right? People tend to move around quite a lot. So, of course, then, for instance, there is there, uh, there is the discussion, uh, of course, that uh, Manila, the Philippines is in an earthquake zone. So there is a lot of uh, preparatory work for planning that goes on. What would happen if an earthquake hit near Manila, for instance? And of course, if you're an aid agency, it can be really useful to know then what's the difference if an earthquake were to hit at noon on a Wednesday or at midnight. Because again, you have official statistics. You can Google each city in Manila, how many people live there. But of course, depending on the day and the time of the day, that's not going to be correct, or it's going to be quite different. And of course, this is the same for a, a, a camp like this. If you see this snapshot, it's a really great snapshot. You can make an estimate, say 14,000 people live in this camp. And if you compare for a few weeks before, you can say now it's 12,000 people. So we can see now it's, it's 14,000 based on our models. But again, there is a, a small challenge here. We don't know if it's exactly the same 12,000 people plus 2,000 new people. Or if uh, 5,000 people left, and then we have 7,000 people coming in. And again, if you're an alien, you see the government, of course, that matters a lot, depending on is it food you're going to send, is it medicine, what type of needs do the people in the camp have. So again, you only see the snapshot, the stocks, but you don't see the flows. So it's good, but uh, there are some problems with it. So then uh, we have, going back to the post-quake uh, in, in Haiti, so this is actually, this is uh, right after, this is the morning after the earthquake in Haiti. This was taken by one of our collaborators at Digicel. Uh, so Digicel is the largest operator, mobile operator in Haiti. Uh, this is actually, was the only earthquake proof building in this part of the city. Uh, so this is one of our contacts going to work uh, the day after. Uh, and then one of our collaborators, Linus, who's the medical doctor, he deployed to Haiti as part of the UN uh, aid program there. So he was working in the UN camp uh, with WHO, specifically doing all these things that I mentioned, like uh, planning on distributing medicine, planning the, the hospitals, all these things. And he ran into exactly this problem that I mentioned. So every morning they have a big cluster meeting. It's a room full of people like this. 
but not so quiet as you are, everybody screaming, yelling, different statistics, everybody has questions, trying to get different answers. And uh, everybody is trying to figure out where are the people, where should we send the, the stuff today? And do we have any updates on the information? Do we have some new, have somebody called? Did somebody get some new information or statistics? So uh, Linus then uh, who works with uh, mobile data or sort of new applications, because in Sweden that's a big thing, telemedicine, all this stuff. So we actually, in one of these meetings, he got the idea, saying, okay, but the mobile operators, they know where the people are, right? So they can see that in the system. So if we could access their data, we might be able to understand something about where the people, the people living in Port au Prince, where they went after the earthquake. So uh, he went there, knocked on the door, came to um, lots of meetings, uh, actually pretty stressful meetings, but we were really fortunate. So there were two people there, the CEO and the technical head extremely smart people and also given the fact that Digicel actually did really well since the, this was a this is an earthquake building and the earthquake hit at five o'clock in the afternoon everybody was still at work so Digicel as a company only lost eight people and people sort of that were not in the building everybody that were in the building was fine but of course they lived through this and everybody knew uh, families or friends that were affected so they could see the use of this type of application. So they really pushed uh, through the project. Uh, and what then we specifically wanted was the CDR, the call data records. And this is the snapshot of what it looks like. So call data records, that's the standard billing information that all the mobile operators have. So basically in, an, in the, the operator system, you have an A number, that's whoever calls. So you call a friend, you're the A number, the B number is your friend. Uh, you can see if it's a call, it's a text, if it's on data transfer, the date and time, the data volume, and of course the operator needs this in order to pay you money for using the network. So this is very standard information. And then what we were more in uh, most interested in is also the cell ID. This is the, the tower, the nearest tower. So your mobile phone always connects to the nearest tower. And when you move somewhere, it's going to connect to another tower. And this information is also stored in the system. So the agreement that we managed to get was with Digital Haiti was to get uh, this type of information, but then anonymized, so all the numbers were scrapped. So obviously we didn't want to have people's personal information. And also the data points were only once per day. So one activity per day, one text activity per day. And then the tower location. Because then that means that there's no GPS tracking or anything like this, but then of course every day you can see where, which tower a person were. And if a person then moved over a week, then you can then develop a movement pattern. And again, the resolution is cell tower, which means that it's a, a square kilometer depending on the tower. So quite low resolution, so nobody would see people were sitting in a room talking to each other, but you could see if somebody was in the city or outside of the city. Uh, and then based on this information, uh, was then able to produce these point estimate maps. So the point was to get data on people from Port-au-Prince and then see which region or county that they, uh, or province that they went to. So this is then an estimate of which provinces the Port-au-Prince people went to and also if, uh, to what extent they were moving back. So this was then done and delivered to all the UN agencies on a semi-regular basis, but every every few weeks there was a new type of update saying the people in Port au Prince, are they still sort of in the provinces with family and friends or are they moving back to, to Port au Prince? Um, and this was of course then not super real time, but it was a lot better than a lot of the estimates that we used. Uh, other estimates. Then unfortunately for Haiti they had another problem and that was in October. Because, because of the earthquake, and Haiti is an aid-intensive country, so after the earthquake, a lot of UN agencies came in, a lot of UN uh, personnel and staff came in, and uh, specifically, and this is politically sensitive, but it's open now, so a Nepalese UN camp was set up in this area here, and there was no cholera in Haiti before, but there is cholera in Nepal. So the theory is that there was a lot of uh, sewage that was dumped in the river, and then gone down to this city of Mirbalé, which is a big city. And then what happened was that you had a very strong color epidemic breaking out in the city. And then of course, for the aid agencies, that's another panic. Oh now we have a color epidemic, it's really strong. There is no cholera, or was no cholera in Haiti, so people have no resistance to it, we don't have any vaccines. 
So what should we do? Now we need to send in resources, medicine, everything like this. And by that time, now there was a good relationship with Digis, unfortunately. So all the agreements were in place and we knew who to talk to. So we were able to get new data. And then within 12 hours of getting that data, we then make new analysis looking at the people in the infected area, which is our deponent. And again, the gut feeling, if you're an alien and you hear there's an epidemic, you're going to send all the doctors and medicine to that area. But actually, these analysis show that a lot of people were actually leaving this area. Going to, a lot of them are going to Port-au-Prince, but also going north and to this island here. So of course, if, if you want to contain an epidemic, it's as important focusing the resources on where people are going and not only where they're coming from. So unfortunately, uh, yeah, the, the epidemic wasn't contained, so it's still endemic, uh, ongoing in, in Haiti. Uh, but again, it, it was quite useful and it was a lot better than any other estimates that could be taken at the time. So, and of course we're academics, so we like to validate stuff, because these maps look really good and people were super excited. But then the big question again was, okay, so how good is this method? Can it, uh, what, what does it actually represent? So in the months then after this work, uh, collected the data. So the National Civil Protection Agency, that's the government's statistics on where people went, and where people from Puerto Rico went. And these red staples, that's the mobile data. And you can see when we then did the comparison, it was kind of interesting to see that they don't match at all. So the estimates that we did based on the mobile data was really, really different from the official statistics that a lot of the UN agencies used, right? You can see it's, it's very different. But then also a few months after, because this is also interesting for the UN, so one of the agencies did a big survey. So they went to 12,000 homes or households, and then they followed up. So they asked the households, so where did you go after the earthquake? How long did you stay? When did you move back? So to really get a good idea of what happened. And then when we got that data and compared it, we can then see that, again, uh, that the red and the green are two different types of analysis. The yellow one is the UN statistic. But that big survey and the mobile analysis were much more correlated. And again, I mean, it's, uh, it's really hard and nobody really knows what's true. But uh, the assumption is that this big retrospective survey should be better than the crisis statistics that we used at the time. And then we can see, of course, that the, the mobile analysis were more precise and more fast than what was used at the time and the retrospective survey. So it seemed like it's, it's a good uh, method. Uh, so then, of course, we published uh, academically and also there was some media attention to this case because it was a very high, high profile case. And uh, fortunately also, the, the media was really positive, especially with the privacy aspects. This is actually pre-NSA Snowden, all this discussion. Uh, but then in Sweden, privacy is a big thing, and uh, they really went through how the data was handled and managed, and said that this is, this is a good case on how to use the data. Oh, and yeah, as, as a follow-up also, so what we were able to do, again, in the post-event research, we were also able to develop some predictive models that we've also then tested. So actually what's a bit interesting if you work in this is that in general, and this has been shown in a lot of countries, if you have a lot of data, you can predict where people are going. And what we've tested is that this is true also for disasters and for conflict. So we've tested this on Haiti data and on Ivory Coast data. So if there is a long enough time frame, and again, this is not uh, science fiction, like weird stuff, tracking where you go uh, at night, these types of things, but on a larger time scale, there is a quite high probability that if there is a big disaster, using this type of data with a long enough time frame, you can have some pretty good statistics on where people are likely to go. And this is, of course, also quite useful to do emergency preparedness, so preparation of different events in places where you know that they're going to happen. And so this is uh, one of the more high-profile cases, but then, of course, uh, it's sort of very uh, se a sensitive area with all this data because it's, it's personal data, it's uh, a lot of discussion now is going on, especially on the privacy side of it. So then both the World Economic Forum, the policy discussion, the policy group, and GSMA, which is the Mobile Industry Association, have working groups looking on this, and of course we're discussing 
them all the time. Uh, because it's a really hyped area, but it comes with a lot of problems that I will also go into in a second. So, yeah, does uh, this it sound cool? Is it a cool application? Everybody should do this, right? Uh, hands up, uh, everybody thinks this is a good application. All of them. Uh, so, yeah, so most people like, really like this application. It's really high. But if you think it's a good idea, you're in the same company as every UN agency, every major university, and every big NGO like the Red Cross or something else. So, ever since 2010, uh, this has been a super hyped area. So, most big UN agencies are wanting to do projects in the space and launch different types of projects. Most NGOs have been trying to start a project like this. Uh, many of the big operators uh, have told us that they get one call a week from some group wanting to do some kind of mobile data project. And then I wanted to go into the two big uh, fallacies or misconceptions uh, in this space. Actually, it's a lot of them, but I've grouped them into two. Uh, and in order to make it easier to remember, I've also uh, done uh, some movie thing on it because it makes it easier to remember. So, who's this? No? Hey, hey. Exactly. Okay, everybody did not see Harry Potter? Okay. <laughs> so, this is Severus Snape. Okay, so he's a, visit, he's a wizard and he's a potion master. So, in any type of problem, there's some giant or a big monster coming along, he can cook up a potion, a magic potion. And once you just use the magic potion, it solves so the first fallacy is the magic potion fallacy and that's kind of tied to the concept of big data in general and maybe mobile data in particular. So the first thing uh, that you want to remember is that quantity is not the same thing as quality. So when people talk about this, this is true for commercial stuff as well, I guess uh, you're going to commit to that. But I'm talking from my experience, you can see if it's, it's the same. When people talk about big data, they tend to focus on the big. So they always talk about how many terabytes, how many millions of data points, billions of data points, endless years. But that's not necessarily a quantity in itself. So just because you have one billion data points doesn't mean that the data set is better than if you have one million data points. Again, it depends on what the data is for and what you're supposed to do with it. So big data is just a lot of data. So. Uh, I think you have some analytics courses here at so the, the AIM, right? So then you should learn the standard principles. So you always need to clean and check the data. And what we've learned is that the big data just needs big cleaning. So we have to sit for months and clean it. Just because it comes from a database doesn't mean that it's perfect. Always some troubles and uh, some errors and, yeah. If you have done a small Excel sheet and find some errors in it, this is the same, but with billions of data. Uh, and then again, if a data set is big and clean, that's super cool, but then it also needs to be the correct data for whatever you're going to use it for, right? So if it's not if it's not the correct data, if it's just garbage, then you're just going to get a big pile of garbage instead of a small pile of garbage, and it's going to take longer time to analyze. So you really have to have uh, sort of the correct data. And then if we talk about big data, mobile data, it doesn't, it's not, the data set that solves any problem. So you have to understand what you're actually working with. So again, this goes back to the team composition that we have. If you want to model infectious disease, you have to understand infectious disease. If you want to solve disaster response, you have to understand the situation in a disaster. So a lot of people get super excited. They say, okay, but let's just get a lot of computer scientists. They can sit in the basement in New York and they can solve all the problems all over the world which is, is not really true. So you actually have to understand the topic that you're trying to solve. And this is, uh, again, the same with business applications. Right? You have to understand the actual problem. Another thing with uh, mobile data, for instance, is that it's, of course, heterogeneous. So in uh, Haiti, we were really lucky that we noticed after the fact, because Digicel, first they were quite big, the, the, the biggest operators, so they had the biggest market share, and that's good. But more importantly, they were representative of the population. So as a statistical sample, digital subscribers turned out to be representative of the population. This is not always the case. Um, in a lot of countries you can have, I think Indonesia have like eight operators. So even if you get mobile data, if it's from one out of eight operators, of course the utility is going to be different. More importantly, who are the customers? 
So when we did this uh, work in uh, Ivory Coast in our uh, big project data for development, it's an academic project with MIT. So Orange, uh, the big French multinational company, they released data sets so a lot of researchers could use it. And they're the biggest operator in Ivory Coast. Yeah. But then uh, what it actually turned out is that the only team that went to Ivory Coast was our team. And we did some field work in Ivory Coast. And then we also figured out that Orange is the biggest subscriber, but they're also the most expensive subscriber. So that means the really poor people tended to use MTN and other operators. That, of course, also means if you get Orange data and you say, yeah, they're the biggest subscriber, they're the best. Then you do analysis, but then you're going to miss out on, on the poor people. And technically, usually in a disaster, for instance, they're the people who need the most aid. We need to understand how the market looks, how the operator looks. Certain countries, certain ethnic groups tend to do certain operators or they're divided by regions. So just mobile data is not a, it's not a single data source. And again, this might be even more important. So usually in a disaster, in an aid setting, people tend to want to identify people. They're like, we want, we're looking for refugees, for instance. And then they go around asking, say, okay, you're a refugee, you're a refugee, ah, oh, you're a refugee. Okay, where were you two months ago? Where do you think you're going next month? And they try to collect the data that way. So what they tend to do in field work or in survey work is that you tend to identify the right subjects, but you get really bad data on the mobility. In this case, we have perfect data on mobility of a SIM card. But then the question is, what does a SIM card represent? Because the really strong point with mobile data is when people, white people, I think, get super excited that everybody understands it. Okay, I have a phone, you have a phone, and we just get the data, we can track people, that's cool. But the thing is, it might be true for Manila, in Sweden, a SIM card, that's everybody has a personal phone. So one SIM card is one person. And throughout Asia, most countries, people don't have a personal phone. They have access to phones, but they use household phones, or neighbor's phones, or work phones. So some countries, uh, more developing countries, uh, uh, Bangladesh, for instance, parts of India, everybody has access to a phone, but the absolute majority, it's, I think it's less than 30% have a personal phone, and all the rest have access to other types of phone. So that means that if a SIM card in Sweden represents a person, in Bangladesh it could be a family with eight people. Right? So it's very different. And also one SIM card in Bangladesh could be a family with eight people, the other one could be a rickshaw driver, so it's also about understanding the difference between those. So, super uh, important to understand what the data points actually represent. Uh, and then the final thing is that this data is of course super, super useful if you know how to use it, but it's actually quite useless on its own. Because if you only have, for instance, mobile data, you only have mobile data, and in order to answer all these questions and to make sense of it, you have to check it against other data. Survey data, health data, UN data, satellite data. So the data on its own is, of course, quite useless. This is true for most data sources, I think. I think one of the definitions of big data is actually big data is data sources combined with other data, too. This, and you know this better than me. That's one of the definitions. OK, so that's the first. Magic potion fallacy. So that's a lot of misconceptions that people have about data in itself, that it's kind of magical just because it's big data. And then we have the other fallacy. Uh, this one, yeah, it's written out, so you don't have to guess. Uh, so the Star Trek fallacy. So this is the point that when you talk about big data applications, mobile data applications, show the maps, you hear the theme songs, people get starry-eyed, especially when we give presentations to different agencies. They think it's super cool. Now it's going to be, everything is going to be on iPads, it's going to be real time, it's holograms, super sexy. This is true for companies as well, it's hardware, demos, visualizations, super cool. So the Star Trek fallacy, that ties to the actual application and impact of this stuff to aid work, right, to commercial as well. So if the first fallacy is about what people believe that the data will do, that all the characteristics of the data, this is the impact that the data will have. Okay, so again, this might go back again then to one of the previous points, but the first thing is that the data is just a tool, it's not the solution. So just setting up a supercomputer center and having a billion data points hasn't solved the problem. Right? So again, you have to start with the problem, define the problem, and then get the data. This is classic research design. 
Whereas uh, what seems to be quite trendy is starting with the data, the hardware, the software, and then let's just build a supercomputer center and let's just data mine and figure it out there. Let's just, uh, and this is also in some of the discussions we have had and we've heard other mobile operators had with agencies. They get contacted by super famous big international agencies saying, give us the data. Sure, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, we'll figure it out. Just give us the data. Okay, where are you going to store it? Yeah, we'll figure it out. Just give us the data. Okay, but then who's going to run it? Yeah, we'll hire someone. Just give us the data and everything else is going to work itself out. But again, you have to start with the actual problem and then decide what you need to do. Uh, the other point is that all this remote sensing data, satellite data, mobile data, Again, the idea is a lot of people get super excited and say, yeah, let's get some pro computer scientists. They can just develop an iPad app and we can just get back. We don't have to go there. It's, it's hot, it's dirty. We have to ask people, people live. Ooh, how do you just have a nice app that's all set or a software? And the point is then that remote sensing data can improve or augment the field data, but it can never replace it. You still need to understand what's going on on the ground. You have to ask people if you have a work on the ground. So no iPad app will ever replace doing the actual work, which is actually a, true, a real question that we got from a really big agency. Our top, our, our most, our favorite questions internally is, can you develop an app for this? Can we get your software? And can an intern do this in Excel? And none of these are of course true. We don't do software development. We do actual and again, all of this should then have convinced you by now that this can't be automated either. It's still always going to be manual. Work. Again, if we talk about yeah, big data in general, survey data, that's personal data. If we talk about the mobile data, that's super complex and sensitive. Uh, a lot of people, again, say that, okay, so now why don't the operators just give out all this data? I mean, it's, it's so good. They should just give it away. Everybody could just access it and run it. And then, of course, yeah, and a really popular term, and I don't know if you've heard this from the A. In the development sector, a really popular term among data agencies now is data exhaust. So the concept there is a lot of commercial companies produce data like smoke, it's like exhaust from a car. It's a lot of data, they don't really care about it, but if we could use it, that would be great. And again, mobile data is of course not data exhaust. Uh, so the CDRs that I showed you, that's like going to a hospital and asking for the medical record. So we're going to a bank and say, could we have all, all your transactions, transactions, all the kinky website stuff that people have bought and all the illegal stuff. Just give it to us and we'll figure out what to do with it. So for instance, mobile data, that's both from a privacy perspective, of course it's super sensitive, and from a commercial perspective. It's of course also sensitive because that's the customer data, that's where the, all the cell towers are. All the information that any mobile operator would not want to give to their competitor. Uh, a lot of people work with maps, mapping, and they've seen the maps from Haiti and from other places. Uh, they said, yeah, give us the data, we'll just do cool maps. And again, this is not just, this might be, you, I don't know, have people here work with GIS systems? Okay, no, of course. Yeah. Okay, so here knows what I'm talking about. So yeah, there are a few programs how to produce these maps. And a lot of statistics are available in data nets. So if you get the data, just import it into the map. And of course, mobile data is, is much more complex and big. It contains geographic information, but you have to understand all the issues that I might with you. And maybe most importantly, so when we present the Haiti case, people get super excited and they're like, yeah, just copy paste this worldwide or find some countries. Just copy paste. I mean, it worked. It worked in Haiti, right? You just do it. And again, with all the issues, Haiti was a case, it was one event. Now we're working in Bangladesh, that's another country, other operator, other event, other demographics, other subscriber base, uh, other political situation, other stakeholders. So again, it's not just <coughs> taking a method of analyzing data and copy-pasting it, but each, it's a political, technical, regulatory, legal, every case is unique, so that's why. Not, uh, it's not. So, that's why not everybody, every country is doing the Haiti stuff right now. So there has still been no follow-up, uh, similar follow-up cases from from Haiti, even though it was. Finally, one sort of buzzword that goes into big data is real-time. 
because now we have all this stuff and not only can we get it on the iPad, we can get it in real time, which is super cool, and then we get everything in real time. And of course, technically, the data is generated in real time. And for development data purposes, it would be possible to extract it in real time. But technically possible, so is this jetpack that you can buy today. And you don't have to commute Manila traffic, you can just fly to work and fly home. So this year, this is a marketing jetpack you can buy today. It's quite expensive, but it's technically possible. But again, same thing here. Why why doesn't everybody buy the marketing jetpack? Yeah, but possible is not always the same thing as scalable, cost-effective, or value-added. So when we talk about big data and real time, there are a number of issues, of course, relating to that. One is, first of all, for for development purposes, for commercial purposes, there might be a return on investment argument for doing things in real time. For development applications, maybe not so much. So getting this data in real time would be extremely costly, uh, a lot of security liability issues, uh, extremely, extremely expensive. But again, most importantly, even though this data is available in real time, again, it has to be validated against ground data, against other data, medical data. And that data is not available in real time. So even if we were to set up a system that produces one data source in real time, I would say the only thing we have then is the opportunity to make mistakes in real time rather than maybe exporting it, analyzing it, and making a timely decision, but one that's actually correct. So uh, real time is possible, but not, not always the best thing. OK, so I'll do it in my last five. Five, 10 minutes. I'll just mention another data set that could be interesting for, for you guys uh, that we're also uh, affiliated with, and that's WorldCom. So it has an own website, and you can also find it through through our own website. So WorldCom is an open access archive, so it's uh, free, it's open, and you have spatial demographic data sets. So all the data is, is freely available. And this can be used then to do maps. So what's in WorldPop? So WorldPop is a, an attempt to build an open data set that has the global population distributions. So a high resolution data set of where all the people in the world are. It's not ambitious at all, it's just a whole And then you, but then you might ask, okay, everybody, we have this already, right? We have population statistics, UN, World Bank, that's what they do, they, they have all this stuff. And they do. But again, as I mentioned, a lot of the, the population statistics that's collected, that's collected pretty uh, rarely. This is the case of, from Africa. So if we look at some countries, we can see the latest census that was made was made in 95, so it's 20 years old. So if you go online and you Google how the population of a country, for Africa, most of the estimates are almost 20, 50 to 20 years old. And again, usually they're on the country level, maybe the city level. So World Cup, and this uh, work is led by Amit Tatum, the geographer that I mentioned. So, and they've been working with this for a few years. It's merging a lot of different data sets. You have, in the last few years, a lot of other data sets that come up on uh, access to roads. People have actually uh, gone uh, open street maps. People have gone around on the ground with GPS tagging roads, pathways, houses. Uh, and also satellite uh, imagery uh, that's available. So for instance, uh, merging all these data sets, so this is a typical census count uh, in an area, and then once you get an estimate, the problem with this is if you say there's one million people in this area, of course then it's a blanket assumption that there's one million people in this area. But that's of course not true, the same as in Manila. So when merging this data set can actually increase the resolution, and this is rasterized, you can actually zoom into uh, down to a resolution of 100 times 100 meters. Of course, this is not the truth. This is based on a lot of statistical modeling, but it's it's a lot more high resolution than a lot of things that are out there. So we have now uh, population distributions for a lot of countries, and uh, so this is the population distribution. So the number of people. And now what's also being added is poverty maps. So using a lot of satellite and then household survey data is now mapping the socioeconomic level of people. 
to a very high resolution. So in, in this, that this is a map of Pakistan, and it's a bit washed out, but you can see that the redder, it's a heat map, and the redder the area, the hotter the area, the more people are living below the, the poverty line. Um, yeah, I talk so much about it, you can look at it. But just to mention, so, well, okay, so one book is not alone. We have three different projects. One is the US government funded, it's called LandScan. They were recently open, but uh, just became commercial. Uh, the other one is called GRUP, which is based at Columbia University. It's the uh, Global Rural Urban <coughs> Mapping Project, exactly. I wasn't testing it, I actually didn't remember. <laughs> uh, and then you have WorldPop. Uh, and again, all of these are actually really good, uh, because there was a recent study uh, for instance, if you want to work in aid and development, if you want to make an assessment of an area, for instance, make an assessment of how many people in an area are at risk for floods or tsunamis or earthquakes. Of course, it's no good having a provincial estimate of how many people live in a place. You want to know how many people are living within a certain uh, distance from the coast area. Uh, so in a recent uh, benchmark study uh, published, I don't have the reference in my head, but Website, okay. Using a more high grid data set, uh, a better data set, gave countries like Indonesia and Japan the margin of error is about seven, seven and a half million people, depending on the data set that you use. And of course, that's that's a pretty big deal if you want to plan for saving people. Uh, and of course, this is also useful for uh, understanding long term dynamics such as urbanization. So, here's one image from Vietnam. And is also from China. So again, uh, going back to the satellite imagery from previous, this is snapshots. Of course, it's not close, but again, it's high resolution and it gives a lot better uh, detail than a lot of the official statistics. So uh, yeah. So if you want to go into big data, you should uh, download the data sets. Ask Hero to give you an introduction on how to use it, based on the format, or maybe not. Alright, so that was the short week. Uh, so, any clarifications or questions? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much. Uh, it was really, very really exciting to look at the system. Uh, first, uh, I have some questions. Uh, I'm from Bangladesh. Uh, I'm from Bangladesh. And uh, for professional adjustment, I have some sort of experience working with the digital. Uh, so, my first question was, uh, you mentioned in the uh, second part of your presentation that through mobile tracking, it is very possible to ensure them, but it is not possible in Bangladesh. So, would it... Uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, this was one, one very significant, uh, uh, I think, hurdle to use it in many of the countries for specific tracking those people who are being affected by this. It is one thing. Uh, can there be any other alternative ways to apply in those countries. Second one, you are talking about the model of displacement. So uh, these sort of models are, perhaps you know about CEGIS in Bangladesh. They were working with uh, ECAD as well, with Dr. Sarimul Hakan and some other guys. So uh, they were working with uh, river bank erosion, and in the same time they were trying to track the displacement of the people. So erosion was quite predictable, but displacement was very difficult for them to predict. So, uh, through your model, is it possible to, uh, how feasible it is to track this as a proper model for this placement? Yeah, exactly. I have two questions. Directly, it's actually our uh, counterpart, I think. Yeah. 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 Uh, the first question was the difference between Sweden and, and uh, Bangladesh. Yeah. Uh, so my point was just that in, in Europe, for instance, a uh, SIM card is normally, uh, in Sweden, I think it's 90% of SIM cards are uh, subscribers. Right, so I register and I make so one SIM. Well, of course, I can. my friends can use it, but the normal thing is one SIM is tied to one person. In Bangladesh, a lot of surveys have shown that most people that have access to phones don't have a personal phone, but it's the household phone or a chair. Uh, it's still useful because, again, we're not looking to track you. We just want to, so what we're doing is trying to essentially, same as a lot of um, commuting researchers, so for city planning, a lot of people try to understand commuting patterns. So then they count commuters and cars. 
right? So you, by counting cars, you can understand the traffic flows, and then you can understand. So what we want to do is similar with a SIM card. For us, it's not a problem if it's a household phone, as long as we can understand that it's a household phone. Because we don't want to track the individual, we want to understand. Uh, so if we understand if it's a household, then it's fine, right? Did that answer the question? It's, no? Okay, so. Okay, so if this SIM card is one person, and here's a SIM, SIM card for one person, and they move to this place. Okay, this is Sweden, right? So we, we know that there's a 95% probability a SIM is the same as a person. Say, for instance, in Bangladesh we have a SIM and it's a household phone. One phone is actually four people. Yes, I, I, I got that point. Like, uh, in that case, you are trying to estimate it based on the household size, something like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we have, again, we, work, we are not interested in targeting this person. Right? I mean, for, for commercial purposes, you might be interested in a specific person. For, uh, I don't know, law enforcement purposes, it's one specific person. For us, it doesn't matter, as long as we have a good model of understanding that this actually was four people moving, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because we, we, we want to have statistics. We don't want to track individuals, we want to understand thousands of people moving. So then, this is just a, the same is just a sample. Okay. So as long as we understand the data, then, then it's still fine. Uh, and then the other question, yeah, so the problem is that, yeah, erosion, uh, yeah, for the riverbank erosion in Bangladesh, uh, sanitation, of, uh, that's actually one of the big uh, ICA uh, UN projects right now, is understanding livelihood degradation. So if you have a village, and it's an agricultural village, and you have erosion, at some point the farmers can't grow any more rice, so then they have to move and they go to, to Dhaka. So this is one of the big ongoing projects that they're doing there now, it's a livelihood project. And then, Again, if, yeah, so one of the ideas there is to see if, I mean, that's the research question. Can we use mobile data in Bangladesh as a sample to understand the, the migration and displacement? So it's a research question, but I would say that we hope, uh, yeah, we, we hope that it's quite plausible to do it. Again, since we're only looking in the long-term statistics. So if we want to look at the erosion, as you say, it's not really for us important to understand that you left on Tuesday going there. We're going to look at a time scale of maybe two years and say we had 10,000 people here, or 10,000 phones. We've gone there, we've done surveys. We know that it represents uh, approximately the population. And now two years later, a third of those phones have moved to Dhaka. Then we can make an assumption saying it seems like a third of the population is that similar to India. But that's, that's actually uh, that's the research project that we have right now. Uh, so it's a good question. That's the one we were trying to look at. One more quick question, sir. Uh, like, uh, the model you want, the data set and the practice you are doing, this is uh, useful for only research or is it also useful for emergency responses? If it is also for emergency response, then how how long it takes like for preparing the report? Uh, and also whether you have some auto generation of report scope or something like yeah. that. Yeah, uh, again, like I, mean, has. I mean, so technically, technically the data could be exported in almost, I mean, as I, as I mentioned in the cholera outbreak, so when we got the data, we could do the maps within 12 hours, and that was doing it manually on that. Of course, that could be down to a few hours, uh, but the thing is, uh, a lot of things need to be in place. You need to, understand, you need to have done the preparation work, you need to understand what it is. Because, again, the problem is, if there was a disaster tomorrow, we went and did some maps, and say, here are the maps. If we don't know what the data is, what the, how representative it is, it's just going to be wrong maps. So we need to have done survey data, we need to have data from the ground, we need, yeah. Uh, but in a best case scenario, I would say, uh, yeah, within yeah, days, like 12 to 24 hours, I think. But again, thanks. One, one quick follow-up question to that. Um, in the beginning, you said something about uh, that some of those data flows and some of the, the big data could be quite predictable. 
So is it also possible <coughs> then if, if you see, uh, look at certain areas that you do some kind of ex-ante uh, uh, predictions with, with big data or is that taking it one step too far? Uh, could you qualify a little bit more? I think this is what we're talking about. Yeah, so, yeah. so here you talk about predictability of population displacement. So let's say, um, uh, look at the, the big hurricane that went over the Philippines uh, a while back in Uganda. Uh, when you saw that coming, is then the use of big data also useful to see where, where the population okay, will go so and what you do? Yeah, I can explain. So the, the mathematics here, the analytics is, is quite sophisticated, but the basic idea is quite simple. And that's the fact that when people are, have problems, they tend to go where they have friends and family. That's the basic idea. Uh, so if your house breaks down, you're going to go to your, your friends and family. And if you know that before, and this is like saying for uh, so actually in Haiti, the idea for this came from looking at, uh, there's a very high correlation where people spend Christmas in where they went back to work. And the assumption that is that that's with their friends and family, so that's where they are. Uh, it's just that we were able to show that. My question also related to this. Especially when we talk about the emergencies, because you mentioned in Haiti and other areas, the first thing uh, which is to, uh, if, if there is a mega disaster like in Haiti or like in Yolanda or the earthquake in 2005 in Pakistan and many other countries, the first thing which is collapsed is the communication. Your cell phone is, uh, I mean, there is no cell phone, no uh, satellite tower. So how you will track these people? I am still um, thinking about this. So two things. Actually, in, in a lot of natural events, Actually, and especially, I mean, operators know this. So if it's a if it's a disaster-prone area, they try to build a stable network. In Haiti, for instance, actually, the network. What the most common problem with the network after a disaster is that people text and call, so it's congested, but it's still working. Right. So uh, because everybody tends to send a text or try to call right after the earthquake, so they overload. It's just like if you're a big if you're at a big game or a concert. The phone doesn't work because there are too many people trying to call. So it's the same. In most cases, that's true. Uh, and secondly, I mean, this is also the thing is uh, the displacement. Uh, if you have an event here, I mean, in Haiti, during, I mean, nothing happens during the earthquake. And not only the communications are down, but usually logistics are down too. Boats are gone, no cars. So actually, the displacement usually starts in the preceding weeks. And then you have an outflow like this. And then you have reconstruction, starting to rebuild, and then people are starting to move back. And this, uh, here we're talking days and weeks, and the actual uh, displacement and migration goes on for maybe a year after, or several years after. So actually for us, the day after doesn't really matter, it's a month after, because what we're looking at is, is the displacement over time. So the Haiti analysis, I mean, that was also uh, two and a half months after the actual earthquake. So, so, so it means that if you leave the operation, maybe you cannot rely on this. But, but maybe after the relief, because in, in disaster, there are different phases, so like the relief and rescue, and then we uh, go back to the... Yeah, okay, so, so we, we cannot rely on your uh, model on the first, first phase. Uh, but it's, okay. uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's different resolutions. Again, uh, I can... Uh, there is... Uh, I've heard there is a... a I shouldn't say which company, but one company is developing a monitor. So if, if you go through an earthquake area, a, a crash to building, I can go through it and I can ping phones. So if you're buried under uh, a heap of rubble, I can see, oh, here's a phone. So I can find you in the collapsed building. Uh, so that's when we talk about resolution users and hours after the earthquake. Yeah, we, we were, I think I can answer this question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, yeah, we, uh, I work with uh, this, uh, I work with the ghosts in the Philippines, and uh, what they normally do is because what you see, the the the, uh, the, uh, the the cell sites, actually these are permanent cell sites like they do uh, microwave, but in disaster, for disaster purposes they have visas and usually visas pass for very small aperture terminals, and usually visas could be set up within three days, uh, three three hours, three to four hours you could have a a, 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 a cell site already. Yeah, yeah, I mean, but, but that's a different resolution. So we work usually on the country level and province resolution. 
Again, we, we won't, again, our resolution is to sell power. It might be a square kilometer. We won't find anybody that's buried under a house. That's other applications of technology. This is to see if people have, have left the project uh, a few weeks after. But so, yeah, in a way, you're right. You can use us for immediate Thank you very much for addressing us on the big data. Uh, in, 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 do you suggest any specific tool or anything that we, uh, that we can use in our research uh, for big data? Uh, say how open data is similar to a uh, different from big data. Uh, okay, so again, you had IBM here last week talking about different uh, big data. Uh, big data is just, I've heard different applications. In the development space, uh, you have the volume, veracity, variety on Wikipedia. I think it says several big data sources combined. When I hear people in Asia, you say it's, it's, that, it's data that's too big for Excel. Another, I mean, maybe, maybe, yeah. uh, so big data is just considered usually like extremely large. Uh, I mean, some people say big data is just a new label for data mining or data warehousing, it, where you need to have sort of usually specified specific software or storage solutions. Uh, so it's just a lot of data. Open data, that's data like well, that's data that's openly available. So anybody, it's free. You don't have to pay. Anybody can use it for all types of purposes. I would say that's the difference. Uh, I want to ask, uh, ask about the process of data analysis. You know, what are the uh, because uh, what I see is uh, even cleaning uh, uh, national census data, cleaning living standards uh, data is, is a very tedious task. And uh, here, like you are taking both set of mobile data. What are the like, specific tools and method or uh, tools and software that you use to clean this data? Yeah, so actually, oh, I should. And one more. No, I, should, I actually have a picture of the people ask us what's our sort of uh, database solution. And uh, so I have a picture on Shield's laptop, which he did all the Hickey work on. It's a uh, Lenovo workstation. Since yeah, because like, I'm also like, uh, doing some cleaning, uh, uh, data cleaning process uh, for my own uh, research that I'm writing. Yeah, yeah. So, here. No, so, so the, yeah, we, we don't, I mean, so. Uh, it's standardized stuff, uh, C-sharp, Python, uh, RPI, and everything is off the shelf and it's on, uh, now actually we have some workstations, but I mean, it, it's regular stuff. The thing is, I would say, one of the points, actually I should have put it in there, I have this photo of this laptop, it's a normal laptop, it's just a big one, right? So usually when I put that up, just to show that it's not, I mean, of course it's super cool to have big center with 80 scientists. But the point is it's about, so she, I mean, to take an example, Shin has is, been doing this for five years. We get a raw text file, he imports it into a database, and everything looks the same. And then he's like, hmm, this, I, I have a bad, no, I have to check. And then he finds stuff that's, because there's always problems in the, so it's a lot about just hands-on experience that you need to, I mean, it's tedious, but that's how we learn. One more look. You, you, you recently mentioned about the statistical modeling or while analysis. Can you uh, put some light on what statistical modeling you are? Statistical, statistical modeling for what? Uh, for analyzing the data, as you were saying. I mean, again, it depends on. There's loads of different analysis that are being done. Actually, and yeah, I have 16 minutes, not 16 days. Uh, I'll just refer you to the website and the papers because all the research is published on. Uh, you have all the, again, it's not super updated, but under the research tab, you have all the publications and very pretty specific. But again, it's very different from, we use different, there are lots of different small questions in it. It's not an algorithm that does this. I'm sorry. I don't want to be over time.
Uh, I had a question around like what you mentioned that you know you had another some mobile data and then you had some other organization which also had their competition uh, and they were kind of uh, different in the estimates. Uh, I was wondering, is it possible to you know map mobile data to other data sets uh, which might throw more light on just instead of just knowing a point person going from the yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so that's uh, yes, and that's a good question to clarify. So that's. <laughs> So in, in Haiti, that we did after the fact. Uh, you mean this one, right? Yeah. So, and this we did after the fact. And the point is that, and this is the validation, but the point is that this was not available until six months after. So, uh, but that's what we're yeah, trying to do, backtesting. Yeah, but that's the problem. So mobile data, satellite data, that we have right now, but in order to map it again, the other data might be available in four months. Uh, like sometimes you know banks when you uh, register an account, you have to give your mobile data. So maybe that's already there the banks in advance. You are probably yeah. the hospitals, you know, they might know about the age group and all that. So if you map just the location of the person with like, you know, this person is at this age of this income bracket and all that. So maybe you could probably Yeah, I think the NSA is doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I mean this is our problem is that we also want to uh, keep at a low resolution to avoid everything. And the they do it, but we, we can do it. And it's, uh, is it uh, too sensitive as the you know, relief agencies to help in the tracking by asking people to give their mobile numbers? Uh, or is that like, too, like, you know, people's priorities uh, are not very focused? Still, I mean, this is a really big ongoing discussion, but I know now, for instance, that UNHCR, which is the UN Refugee Agency, uh, I think they're piloting in Syria, or in, actually not in Syria, but uh, in Turkey that you can register, if you go to the camp because people come under a refugee, you have nothing, right? So you get food and then uh, now they're piloting a project where you can get the mobile phone, but then you also consent to them checking if you stay in the camp or if you go elsewhere. So they're, but they also do a lot of uh, biometric stuff and a lot of other things as well. Yes. So I saw um, some mobile operators we do your processes in your application such as Reno, Drumming, or application. So I just wonder what's the motivation or benefits of them collaborating with you? Actually, I have a slide for that. I'm not here. Uh, nothing to say. No, but actually, yeah. So the thing is, uh, first of all, it's uh, just Google, right? Uh, they just have got a lot of Google for helping their, uh, I mean, again, the, the people in Digicel, they all lived through the earthquake, this was a big problem, so, but then it was an easy way to, to help out. Uh, and we've been talking to, uh, uh, yeah, we've been talking to some operators, and they say, okay, so goodwill, yeah, but that's, that's nice, but we're about, this is business, right, so we need to make money. But then actually, uh, another operator said, well, we spend millions on customer retention every year, making sure that we keep the customers. And one really smart way of keeping our customers is keeping them alive if there's a disaster. So that's a, we can actually calculate, uh, maybe calculate that in a way. Uh, so, and, and actually for them, I mean, if, if you have your operator, say that you had an earthquake hit Manila right now, you know that uh, the government, the UN agencies, are going to get maybe mobile data to understand where people are. Would you like to, that your operator was part of that or not? It's an earthquake hit now. Yeah. Most people, yeah. okay, most, maybe not here, most people would uh, would say yes to that. Because also the point is, in an uh, normally people don't want to be tracked, and again, this is not tracking. But when there is an emergency, usually it's the other way around. People would pay anything to have the data to In a country like the Philippines, where it's certain, it's certain that every year we're going to be hit by typhoons, what's not certain might be the, the magic. I mean, so there will be people, we're certain there will be people be displaced because of these typhoons. Does it make sense to sort of institutionalize something like this? I mean, the government working with telcos, we're in these data. I mean, there will be a governance structure that they can work with. Has there been a model like that? Where you uh, again, I mean, this is, uh, I would say, I, I'm in a small space, but I would say all the major UN agencies, 
are discussing this, the mobile industry association, the people. There is a lot of discussion, but again, there is loads of regulatory, technical, political challenges. So I would say it absolutely makes sense, but exactly how, uh, that's a big, it's a tricky, tricky thing. But I'm smart. <laughs> IOM was the, they were responsible for coordinating the response to all, uh, all areas outside of, of the workplace. So I've been back, uh, when I was back in Haiti trying to find people that used it, everybody had left already except for Damien, who was still stuck in a container in the UN camp, so it was pretty sad. Uh, but this was in 2013, and in 2013, and that's three years after, they still said that the, uh, the analysis that we did on the mobile stuff was the best. Uh, the only exhaustive stuff, uh, and it was uh, yeah, it was great baseline working with necessary figures to coordinate responsibilities. So a lot of focus was on corporate prints, but uh, that agency thought that that was the best stuff. Uh, we we haven't found any concrete numbers on how many people that were affected, but these were the people coordinating the response, and they say it was the best data that they had to, uh, to use. So I guess that's. Uh, Any other questions? Okay. So, on behalf of the Asian Institute of Management, we'd like to thank Dr. Vetter. Thank you very much. So, 
there's coffee outside uh, if you'd like to continue your discussion. There are also some stands, so thank you very much for coming.